Good morning, Elon. Good morning, boss. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I just was looking at your painting efforts oh, okay. on Facebook. Okay. Yeah, I had a good time last night. It was, uh, you know, we're doing a two, a two week painting. So she's going to be back next week taking the same pose. And uh, I'm probably going to change the angle. You know, um, and I wasn't exactly thrilled, you know, with the fact that she was wearing a hat and everything else, but I got over it and it, it worked out. It's fine. But, uh, you know, it's fun to get out and paint, you know, it was yeah. nice getting out there. Throw a little paint down, got my mind off of, you know, dwelling on other things. So, which is always good. Get you out of your head for a little bit. You got to clean it. Mm -hmm. So, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Yeah. I, miss, I miss the old schedule we had. Which and, schedule uh, was that? Like when we used to show up at Benson every day and uh, oh. okay. before Corona. Yeah. Well, you know, it may not be that long <laughs> before we're back to that. I hope, so. I definitely hope so. Yeah, I would say by the end of the year. Yeah. You know, the county is probably heading that direction. So. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to see what happens. You know. I don't know. You know, I go and I have five sessions on the weekend in uh, Wendy Hill, uh, Spruill Hill. Oh, in Spruill? Spruill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does that mean, five sessions? I mean, they, like you pay about uh, 200 and something mm -hmm. for five sessions. Is that like five uh, so, classes? Yeah. Okay, so five it's weeks. Five, five weeks and I, I choose a lady, Maureen Anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's a nice lady, and oh, she, really the, the class are like 12 people, mm -hmm. uh, two guys and uh, a bunch of ladies. Yeah. And everybody does whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I told you that Maureen took uh, classes with me up in Roswell. Yeah. She's she's a nice lady, mm -hmm. and she's uh, kind of keeps me busy a little bit. But I don't like the results. Like this week's result was terrible. Why is that? Because I choose the wrong picture. Oh. At Google. Okay. It's like where is it? Yeah. It's this one. The, the picture itself, mm -hmm. I don't know, I like the, maybe yeah. the red or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a fall scene, you got a Yeah, it's the fall scene in, uh, in the woods. Yeah. And, and I don't know what I ended up with. Mm -hmm. I'm still working on it, but it's not what I liked. Oh. Well, okay. Can I make a, one or two comments? You can make ten. Okay. So, here's a thought for you. Okay. I like the color that you're using. You know, right yeah. now, it's very kind of pure and very, for the most part, it's kind of intense uh, color. 
and that's okay. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is kind of your interpretation of what you're painting, but you have to you have to address you know two things if you're going to treat this like a landscape um, and not an abstract painting, and you could go either direction, but uh, for one is toward the top of the painting, you're gonna to have to modify those colors and just begin to slightly mute them down so that they'll sit back and that the colors in the foreground will come forward. So you gotta make a difference between them. Because, yeah. yeah, because toward the top of the painting, they're further away from you. Toward the bottom of the painting, they're closer to you, right? Yes. Uh, and then the second thing is your road. Um, you've got to narrow the road toward the back uh, so that it diminishes as it goes back and it looks like it's, you know, going back in perspective. It, it can't be the same size, you know, at the back as it is in the front because the front's closer to us. So it's going to... Okay. So those are the two things that I, I would, you know, recommend right now is just look at those and address those and you know and i think you'll you'll begin to see that the painting will take you know take on some depth okay okay i really appreciate it yeah because right now i mean you know you're you're in the early stages of just sort of blocking color in and that's okay you know i mean all paintings go through this sort of ugly phase right and yeah. uh, yeah, and, and, you know, once you figure out where things are, then you can start kind of manipulating and playing with it, okay? Okay, thank you very it much. The way you want, okay? Thank but, you. Yeah, but yeah, don't, don't throw in the towel on it. It's, it's fine. It's, okay. you're just, yeah, you're just early on, and you got a few things to work out. Not a problem. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for sharing it. So. You're the boss. I'm the boss. <laughs> yeah, not really. Hey, Bob. Hello, yeah. good morning. Yeah, Bob's here, Veronica's here, Naomi's here. I don't know whether she'll talk to us or not, but we'll see. Maybe we'll hear from her before the end of the class. How's everybody doing? Hey, good morning. Hey, John. How you do? Okay. You got your artist look with your beret today, huh? That's right. I'm keep I'm keeping the top of my head warm. <laughs> yeah. I de I decided I decided to adopt Elon's haircut. Ah, very good. Yeah. So I I I sort of mowed everything off the top of my head. So it's a little it's a little chilly up here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what can you do? Yeah. Anyway. Um, let's see. How are we doing time-wise? So everybody have a pretty good weekend? Hey, Veronica. How are you doing? Good morning. Doing well and you? Um, hey, it's Monday. We're here. Yeah. You know, we're here. We're awake. We're on the right side of the grass. You know, we're ready to go. You know, I was telling the guys, if, you know, that uh, I, I decided to take a set of clippers to the top of my head, and, you know, so I'm, I've adopted Elon's Oh, look. my God. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, my God. Oh, okay. Well, you still have time. Christmas is, is uh, several months away. You know? <laughs> <laughs> we can still be Santa Claus in December if you work on it. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah. Well, you know. So anyway, yeah, that's why I got my little uh, beret. On. You want my? You want some of my pigs also? Some of your what? Pigs. Oh no. Uh, oh. No, I can do without the pills. Thanks. You know. <laughs> they go here. <laughs> yeah, actually, no, I'm fine with it. You know, I mean, hey, look, it's easy. You know, I don't have to go to the barber shop. Yeah. You know, I've I've got I've got a set of clippers. I've got a a particular guard at a certain length, and the beard, 
and the hair and everything, it's all the same length, you know? Okay, all right, okay, just go around and around. Well, I know we'll get a chance to see your collection of, of berets now. That's right. I know you have quite a few of them, so we'll I do, I, yeah, mm -hmm. I do. I've got, I've got I'm, a, I'm a big hat collector, I like hats. Yeah. You know? Me too, I do too, but I don't get a chance to wear them very much, but I, I like them also. Mm -hmm. You know, when you grow up someplace where it's cold, you you know how you love hats. You have lots of them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've got winter hats and winter caps. <laughs> yeah. Well, right. actually, here, what is it? Uh, I mean, today is the what, 14th, isn't it? Yeah. 14th. Yeah, well, we're not that far away, you know, because uh, starting on, let's see, when is that Thursday? Yeah, starting April 7th, we're going to start meeting up outside. For those of you who want to come adventure out into the world. And uh, so, you know, little things like this, you know, these little fuzzy hats and stuff like that. Uh, you know, for the first couple of weeks, they might be appropriate. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a little bit cool in the morning out there. So, anyway. But... Uh, I'm looking forward to that, actually. That should be fun. Um, all right. So let's get started. All right. See who's here, first of all. We got eight of us. Yay! All right. So we got Naomi. We got Bob. Rebecca just showed up. June's here. Ilan's here. Veronica. Claudia. Uh, and me. And. Uh, did I miss anybody? Yeah, it's kind of skipping around. All right, so guess what? Today, um, you know, we're gonna go back and we're gonna finish up looking at uh, a couple of different African artists uh, and, you know, the whole subject of African quote unquote art, um, you know, as, as a subject or as a category. Um, and so, you know, I got a couple of videos for you guys to watch. And uh, again, you know, these are probably going to challenge your ideas a little bit about what, you know, African art is really all about. So, you know, we know, we know the traditional aspect of it. We saw a little bit of that last week and how it relates to the culture uh, and, you know, particularly the history of Africa as a whole. Um, you know, and we all, I think, you know, got a chance to look at the range of diversity, you know, in the different types of cultures and things that are there. Um, and there are many. So, you know, it's not one homogenous thing, you know, it's, it's very unique, and very different, you know, with each of the areas that you go to. But what seems to be happening in contemporary African art as I said, is it's becoming more homogenous, right? Um, you know, like the rest of society. Um, those cultures are adapting to a modern way of life. And, you know, it seems like things like McDonald's, you know, and Pepsi Cola and things like that are showing up in everybody's culture, you know, not not just American culture, so. Um, and so that changes the conversation and that also changes the culture in the art. And so we're gonna see a little bit of that, not to control it, but you know, uh, these, particularly these two particular artists that we're looking at today. Um, let's see, Rebecca. Uh, What, what period is it? Is this this modern art now? The, the yeah. time from the last century? Well, no, no. This is like these guys. These guys are still alive, and they're oh, okay. and they are showing. Um, I think this was like in like 2017 or 2018. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, and they're they're showing at the Cape in London. Um, but, you know, take a look at it, see what you think. 
you know, I think you'll, I, I think you'll like, like it. And, you know, you actually get to hear a little bit from the artists themselves, which I think is important, um, you know, because they can talk about their own work. So away we go. Open that up a little bit. All right, we're going to go to full screen. And I'll back it up to the very beginning. And away we go. This summer, eight hundred is dedicating the entire week to the most important artists working together. One is a visionary. The inventor of new languages of the world. Here it is, the incredible dresses. Till now, Tate, Bruce's largest art institution, has never been shared this day to an artist in Africa. This is an incredibly exciting moment. After decades of neglect, the voices of artists like Ibrahim Salafi and Meshach Yaga are finally making themselves heard. What they're saying is this. For a hundred years, the West have been missing a crucial part of the story of Africa. Over five decades, these artists have placed in the world. Is that a, is the sound a little low for most people? Or yeah. is it just me? Yeah, yeah I just turned mine up on my computer. <clears throat> yeah, turn mine up all the way right now. Yeah, mine's all the way and I can't hear too much so, either. You might think mm -hmm. it's most interesting as Africa, we, we are just in the world. Should we be calling anyone an African artist at all? They are simply artists, and they have a right to claim the world. Since 1998, England has been home to a godfather of African modernism. In his 82 years, Ibrahim El Salahi lived in revolution, imprisonment, and rejection. Now he lives quietly. Strange <laughs> enough, I, I, I didn't want to go to art school. I, I meant to go to study medicine. Why didn't you want to go to art school? <laughs> no, I know that I didn't want to really, but I, I felt I wanted to, to, to be a doctor. I wanted to help people. As a promising young artist, El Salahi trained in cartoon in Sudan. At 24, he won a scholarship to one of the world's foremost art schools, the Slade in London. Oh, this, is, this must be really early. Yeah, yeah, quite early. Mm -hmm. This is uh, around about the uh, mid 50s. <coughs> so, El Salahi embraced modernist art. In 1957, he returned to Sudan with a crate full of paintings and organized a show of his work. He must have been so excited on the opening evening of the exhibition, and you felt, must have felt so confident about all these new things that you've learned, that come up, that people would be coming up to. I, I felt great, because here it is, I love the work, I love these kind of wonderful achievements in Europe and so on. The sponsors, they came and they enjoyed the first thing there. Mm -hmm. The first day of the And then they, they, they never came again. And this made me question what I thought in the first If it's not acceptable to people, I did not want to respond to it in any way. For two years, I was really stuck. And I didn't know what, what to do. At the start of the 60s, Ibrahim traveled to Sudan searching for a way to connect. The answer lay deep in his heritage. This is something very valuable. It's a prayer book from the Mahdi Sen, Sufi. You can see the lions together. They look a bit here. This is the, the, the word of Muhammad. Here is the design itself of the um, Think of the M, the hat, the N, the D, 
in this therapy. It feels like an example of them taking letters and then abstracting them in some way. Yeah. The more you play, play around with it, the more you discover the potential of change of design and pattern. The abstract forms of ancient Sudanese culture captured his imagination. Through it, Ibrahim El Salahi discovered his voice. Ibrahim's vast body of work is partly in storage. Some of these paintings have never been seen by the public. They show the powerful way his ideas developed. Let's show you this one. I think we'll have it here, so you can see it better. When was this made? Very, very early 60s. Ibrahim used African motifs, as well as Arabic script, to draw people in. This is Allah never dies. This is the messages which I used to write, people understood. For them, it's far more readable and closer to them than any painting or anything else at all. The writing, the word, which means a lot to them. My message was to the people. Ibrahim became an important figure in the cartoon school, a group of artists who found exciting new ways to fuse modern art with calligraphy. I think through time, it melted into the picture. You can find in the shape, and that's a kind of an A, but has a flourish on top, which is there. So the thing that springs to mind when I look at this immediately is texture. I mix oil colors with uh, enamel paint. So by the time the surface of the enamel paint is dry, I start tickling it. So it wrinkles itself. I wanted to get the smell of the earth itself. Because as children, when we were taken to a new home, they make me smell the ground. They put their hand on the, on the ground and they may take, make the child smell to create the link with Mother Earth. It really seems like you're imparting a sense of Africa. Absolutely. And yes. is that what you're striving to do? Yes, this is to do with identity. Ibrahim's paintings captured the mood of a nation finding its voice. As independence spread further, he became an important figure throughout Africa. It was a very, very lively movement in Nigeria at that time. And uh, not only in Nigeria, but throughout um, West Africa. People became aware of their nationality and uh, uh, identity as Africans. And then there's a world of heritage behind their back to lean on. They want to take it. Yet Sudan's hopes for independence had gone awry. By 1969, it had become a military dictatorship led by General Numieri. Three years later, Ibrahim was asked to become the Director General in the new Ministry for Culture. I felt that there is a need for things to be done and they approached me to come to help in doing it. And I thought that in, in one's own country, if you don't do it, who will do it for you? In 1975, you were working in the Ministry of Culture, yes. and then one day, out of the blue, two people arrive, take you away, and suddenly you're put in prison. I was accused of uh, helping my cousin, a cousin of mine, who happened to uh, be an army chap, and he staged a coup, military coup. Mm -hmm. I had no idea whatsoever what was happening, except that people came and beat the hell out of him. And I was suffering from it. It was many, many years ago. The place I was in was in Cooper Jail, which is the toughest jail in the country. Quite a number of people were uh, executed there. What were the conditions like um, while you were there? What, what was daily life like? Honestly, each day, for lack of food, so proper food that can be edible, uh, lack of medicine, bad treatment, each day looks like a, a year. And this went on for six months and eight days until we were let out. 
Mm. Ibrahim was released on March the 16th, 1976. His arrest was part of a wider government crackdown on artists and intellectuals. When a friend offered him a job in Qatar, he made preparations to leave Sudan. Someone came behind me calling my name. He said, we heard that you're leaving the country, don't leave. I said, why? He said, because uh, the president wants to make you a minister. I said, thank you very much indeed. We said, thank, thank them all. And I'm just going out for a short while and I'll be back soon. <laughs> 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 Ibrahim wasn't to see his homeland again for many years. He took a day job in Qatar. His exhibitions ceased. But Ibrahim had helped pave the way for other artists from Africa. He'd given the next generation a dream. They too could travel the world and invent their own new languages of modern art. The problem was, the rest of the world wasn't listening. In the Western art establishment, there's a strict hierarchy. At the top is Europe and America. Art from Africa is pretty near the bottom. Over the past 20 years, a handful of young African artists have been forcing change, and Mishak Gabra has really shook things up. <laughs> Meshach Gabba's Museum of Contemporary African Art is a huge project. It involves a laborious two-week setup. This installation has 12 different sections. Here you are in Salon, look in living room. You see cushion, you see pit to see, you see how a piano. Oh, uh, but can, wait, can we have a go? Yeah, you can play where you want it. Yeah, look at me, you can play. I only know one song. I know, I'm just learning this song at the moment. Most museums don't let you learn the piano, but this isn't a real museum. Yeah. Oh, what are you going to do yeah. next now? This is the same <laughs> word of the Jovi Salon. Meshach's Museum of Contemporary African Art is an artwork where everyday life is part of the show. It's a labor of love that took five years to complete between 1997 and 2002. There's a games room full of puzzles. An architecture room where you become the architect. And even a marriage room that documents a performance piece. Meshach's actual wedding 13 years ago in a museum in Amsterdam. It's a vision of Africa you might find surprising. I remember the moment I stand with this kind of walk, then people were shocked. People think, yeah, you don't like show your roots. I don't know how many times I hear this thing. But uh, I think uh, my root is what you see there. I don't come from the forest, I come from the city. <laughs> Meshak's story starts 3,000 miles away in West Africa, in Cotonou. Benin's largest city and the place of his birth. Wow. That's, That's amazing. That is amazing. Whoa. The yellow cow. The people in yellow. That's yes, 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 a taxi. Yes. That's a lot of taxis. Yeah. And this is kind of landscape of uh, modernity, really. There's just so many people. Yes. It's incredible. Don't you see the real life of the India. Meshak's taking me to Dan Topka Market, one of the key inspirations for his work. How long do you think it would take to walk around the whole market? Well, I think you'll do one day. A whole day? Yeah, I think. It's so big, my kids. No, monsieur. I'm broke. <laughs> it feels like you could buy anything here. Yeah. Moi, je pense que je vis dans un monde modèle et c'est ce monde que je veux montrer. Maintenant, si quelqu'un a la mentalité romantiste sur l'Afrique ou a déjà dessiné l'Afrique dans sa tête, 
Il est bienvenu. Il n'est pas dans mon Afrique à moi. For Meshach, art can be found in the joy and rituals of everyday life. Everything is a solution. Look, this is a solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're right. It's so beautiful. Yeah, it's really. Is this is this for cooking? It's for cooking. It's super intelligent. It's an object you can go on my own. It looks like a minimalist. Yes, yes. I don't go for art book for learning solution. I go for this kind of market for learning solution. Major Wilson. When Meshach started his career in the 1980s, economic crisis loomed over Benin. Somehow, Meshach managed to turn the situation to his advantage. You like here? I do like here. Yeah, we live here, we work here. It's uh, also at the residency. In the night. Hmm? Oh, okay. Got to go to the next one. Uh... Sometimes people ask me, what do you do? I said, I'm a picture maker, photographer. I said, no, I'm a, I, I, I paint, house painter. No, I wish I were because I could have earned more money having a house painter. <laughs> but uh, I said, I, I paint pictures. I make them on my own and I try to see how they go. I don't differentiate between drawing and painting. It's all art, works of art. But I'm never satisfied at all with what I do because I keep continuously working and this is what gives me the urge to keep on and on and on with it. I believe that the artist, when he works, there are three people to address. Self, the ego, which is, unless you satisfy that ego, no work will come out at all. Secondly, it's the others, the people in your own culture, in your own family, in your own neighborhood. And the third person is all human being, wherever. Might be. The color which I work for some years Fancy and uh, ochre, yellow ochres, whites and blacks. It's the color of the, of the earth in the Sudan, which I care the great deal about. And the idea of uh, organic growth of the picture in the ribbon sandwich of the number one it was one piece. The, uh, the one that they take took. That I did it when I was teaching the art college in Sudan. I remember we had a commission to make some paintings for the municipal council. And with a friend of mine, we had a large piece of cloth, which we primed and worked on it in the studio of where I used to teach. So we separated and we used a scissor where I cut and I got my part and I kept working on it. <laughs> I'm excited about the idea, whatever came through my, my vision. And the thing is that the, uh, I used even with the oil paint, I used um, enamel paint, which was terrible. Enamel paint for a piece of cloth. Hmm. To tell you the truth, when I'm working, I'm not at all aware of what it's going to look like. I work, I feel that as if I am possessed by some other power within me, which is producing that work. And that's why all I can recognize is the nucleus. The nucleus, yes, I can see that this is a, 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 a germ of an idea. I was going to grow into a larger size. I have no idea of so I just keep working. And when I, by keeping working, the work develops by itself and shows me things possibly in my subconscious mind that I'm not at all aware of, of what it's all about. And that's why I prefer not to give it a name. Yes, sometimes it becomes so obvious that, that that has got a name and it tells me. And you know, it's almost like children growing. You give them a name, then later on they change their name and they give you 
another kind of image continuously. That's why I, I almost say, gave up after giving so many names. I said, well, never mind about the name. Let that be judged by the viewer. And the viewer, I think, has got a role to play. That when you look at the work, what the work needs to you is the most, for me, is far more important. Because that is the message. What it means altogether is up to them, not to me. And otherwise, I'll be sort of more like a dictating my thing, having a, giving it a name to start with, and dictating what, what it should, she should understand, or she understand, and leave it to them. Okay, let me go back. I want to get the second part. Of that, uh, this summer, Tate Modern is dedicating an. There we go. 1990s, Meshach made his name with what would become one of the most important themes in his work. This is actually money, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's uh, money, it's safer. These round circles are shredded banknotes. CFA, the West African franc. And when you look here, it's 10,000. So that's, ten, that's a 10,000. Yes. And when you look here, it's 5,000 silver. Did you cut up actual money? It's no. not money that you had. Where it's, did you, where did you it's find nice, dearie thing. I'm for a rich family. I can <laughs> pay my money. But it's not true. The bank had cut them themselves. In 1994, Benin's currency was devalued. Meshak mm. found the bag of banknotes on the street. What was really exciting about this was that a bank had purchased a series of these works. So in a way, they were purchasing what they had themselves thrown away. They were buying back their yes, rubbish. I, I think you said, yeah, it's really a shmik, it's magic. Because you take something, the bank puts in the garbage, and bring back the rubbish for the bank for the bank. <laughs> <laughs> the works were popular within Benin and bought by local collectors. Today, his work hangs in the president's collection. This, this, for me, you see, is lady. It's big press, it's the car, it's the house. It's just power, you know, lady, money, car, house, and power. That's what's on every man's mind. Yes, everybody has in mind. And why I put here, it's fertility symbol for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, that's the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> Despite his early success, the first handful of Western collectors who visited Benin passed him by. Meshak's work was apparently too American, and they were interested in another kind of African expression. Well, I think in the, in the 80s and early 90s, there was an expectation of what African art should look like. And um, there were certainly people who believed that African artists should be self-taught. They should live in rural areas they should not be exhibiting abroad, and their practices should be rooted in local traditions. Je pense que je peux le faire parce que tu vas le vendre très facilement. Mais c'est là, c'est l'émotion et c'est l'environnement qui t'inspire. Et je ne vis pas vraiment dans ces environnements et je ne vis pas avec ces objets. Alors j'ai commencé par me poser des questions dessus. Ce que moi je fais, peut-être que c'est pas de la bonne art. C'est pour ça que j'ai été, au fait, étudié à la Réseau Académie. Parce que je veux comprendre. Meshach was desperate to find his place, and in 1996, traveled to Amsterdam to study. He scoured the art galleries to see what kind of African modern art had been embraced by the West. To his shock, he didn't find any. My dream, dream for all Africa. An artist, I think. If you okay, where I grew up, I can show some my work. Okay, I was some place. I see that uh, my work don't have place there. I was shocked and feel depressed. Don't I decide to create space for my own work? Meshak set to building his fantasy museum, a piece of art that would challenge ideas about who could be an artist. I know there's some more. <laughs> his vision turns the idea of an all-powerful art establishment firmly on its head. 
I, I like us to people don't go in museum and just look at the book around them. The book are not found. Why not? In most museums, the library and shop are a tacked on afterthought. Here, they're part of the art. I think all museums have a shop. Yeah. The book I need one shop. Is, uh, in the desk box. Some of the world's most prestigious galleries allow Meshach to install the museum inside their walls. Yeah. This is Rotterdam, this yeah. is Kassel, this is Bell, this is Miyoki. This is this meta museum, as it were, is contained within the body of another museum, almost like a virus. I think it's quite beautiful. And I think this project is seminal. It's quite unique. There are no other artists that I'm aware of who have done something on this kind of scale um, and with this level of ambition. He was opening a global door. It was not about, you know, African art per se, or, you know, Benin. It, he was talking about the world. He was talking about global accessibility. In 2002, Meshach exhibited his Museum of Contemporary African Art in its 12-room entirety. He became the toast of the European art world. But there were voices who were deeply unhappy about the direction his art had taken. And these weren't from Europe, but Africa. Many people were saying, oh, here are the artists who are copying Western artists. This is what some people said. Many people say, I got come in and I change my work. It made me smiling because I don't change nothing. My first show in Benin is about money, is about devaluation in Benin. When you look at the same subject in my painting, you find an inspiration. My work just grow up. I think that people may have been critical because the Beninese people hadn't had an opportunity to see much of Meshach's work for, for quite some time. And I think that that might have been where the criticism lay. It was less in the work itself and more in access to the work. Meshach decided to return to Cotonou for half of each year. But with no art galleries in Benin, local people still couldn't see his work. So he created a new kind of museum, the Museum of Daily Life, that would take his art onto the streets. an artist qui est exposé dans des lieux lucieux, dans des lieux splendides dans ma vie. Mais quand je viens dans un pays où il n'y a pas tous ces musées lucieux, il faut créer un environnement aussi pour montrer mon travail. Alors c'est comme ça que j'ai commencé par faire des performances de rue, par amener mon travail vers les gens, pour voir comment ils réagissent. Parce que je me rappelle, il a fait une performance à travers la ville de Cotonou. La plupart des gens pensent qu'il a, a fait diriger une religion. Donc il a pris le temps pour expliquer, non, c'est pas une religion, c'est juste un show. Et c'est un peu petit et curieux. Donc pour finir, il commence pas à se comprendre. Je pense que déjà qu'il a été révolutionné dans ça, au niveau du Bénin, parce qu'il a pris son temps aussi à partager, à partager ses idées avec les gens. Donc pour simplifier, c'est la référence au niveau de, de la conception du Bénin. Oui, c'est bien que tu dessines, mais je veux comprendre aussi pourquoi tu as dessiné l'animal ici. Meshach's recently established a residency for young artists. It tackles a serious problem. There are no art schools in the whole of Benin. Moi, je me sens bien parce que il aime mon travail et il est comme un père spirituel pour moi. <laughs> Three days to go till both shows open to the public and Meshach's adding the finishing touches to his museum. It's the largest artwork ever bought by Tate. Next door, 50 years after his last major show in London, Ibrahim's return for his retrospective. <laughs> What's going on, man? Yeah. Who is that? <laughs> Somebody. Somebody, I don't know. You know, you know, when I look in the mirror, 
I look at my face and I sometimes say, who is that? <laughs> Ibrahim al Salahi, the exhibition started off as an initiative by a professor based at Cornell University in the United States. He came to London to propose his exhibition about 20 years ago. Hmm. Nobody, nobody wanted it. It took 20 years to make this exhibition happen. After his self-imposed exile in the 70s, Ibrahim may have stopped exhibiting, but he carried on working, prolifically. His retrospective at Tate spanned six decades. The strange, stubborn nature of the Sudanese Harasa tree is a subject Ibrahim's returned to more than 60 times. Through Sudan's seasons of drought and floods, it withstands them all and somehow survives. They say that this Haraza faltering is the rain. It rejected almost like I did. It reflects also in my mind and to myself that I reject it. I reject oppression. And that's why I say my word openly and clearly through the street. There's one work in the show that many believe is Ibrahim's true masterpiece. The Inevitable. He started it in 1984 as a response to Sudan's brutal civil war. How did it feel when you were allowing these images to come through, when you were channeling some of what we can see here? Torture. Think of it as an, a, a, a chicken trying to lay an egg. That's how I feel. It's not easy. The painting is made of nine panels, a form which developed from his experience in prison. I only had smaller sheets of paper, which I used to cut, chop into smaller pieces, and I borrowed a pencil when I was used to draw with, and then hide the papers in the sand. That gave me the idea of this sort of making little panels and until the image grows, you start it with a nucleus and let it grow. How it grows, you have no control over it. It controls itself. I started as a nucleus with someone who looked like a, a chief of a village riding a donkey. You can see the head of the chief, the eyes, the nose. Ah, oh, I see it just there. Yeah. That's it. Why a chief of a village riding a donkey? I don't know. That's how it came to me. It feels to me like there was a story that you were trying to get out that was causing you a lot of pain. The time of when I was, since I was born, and what I observed in the world around me, and when during my troubles, and all the obstacles which I have faced and so on, all that work into one thing. It's a human right. Coming from two very different countries, from different generations, the Tate install is the first time Meshach and Ibrahim have met. It could be the I saw right here and me, I was feeling happy. I, I was happy to meet you. Can you look to me? And, and on the piano, which is called Hero. I'd love to have one. Yes, I can very much have it. I came to that. That's lovely. Am I allowed to eat it now? Yes, yes. I love you. It's a very sweet exhibition. Yes. Too much later, I'm going to say, the first time in the museum, I had the emotion of my heart to move. It's like the point to lever on my heart, because I didn't think I was going to meet the monsieur. I didn't think I was going to meet the museum. It's what I thought when I had the emotion of the museum. I didn't think I was going to meet the museum. Because a lot of people were going to meet the museum. It's a nice picture. <laughs> Thank you. I like it. Thank you. Thank you. Very simple. Yeah, very simple. Yes. Yes. Now at the age of 82, I have the aches and pains of an old man. But it's a wonderful thing to have a chance in life where you're still alive to deliver what you've been carrying. <laughs> So welcome everybody.
This is going to be a very, very special song. Okay. So what do you guys think of that? I thought it was interesting to uh, watch a man go through his story of his life as an artist. Mm -hmm. and, and he really didn't plan to be that in the first place and watch him evolve. My name is Allison Billy McGreen, I'm a curator of Modern I gotta turn her off. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, and, you were saying. Why, I said it's interesting to watch uh, an elderly person go through uh, uh, their life as an artist and see how he evolved over the years and how he changed and how his his artwork became political and and how he res he resolved a lot of that within himself. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think that he, he was in search for he was a man's search for meaning. He's always, always on search for what would be true to his spirit and what would be true to his native land, in a sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that his body of work is, uh, is very interesting. It tells a lot about him. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of things uh, I, I could see what, what, when he was in certain periods, I didn't necessarily was feeling that. Because uh, some of it seemed to be too simplistic, and when life is not that simplistic many times, and it feels that the artist has the opportunity to really express uh, what was going on in life, they put they put some demands on him in the sense that they were going to say, "This is what we accept, and this is not what we accept here." And I think he began to see some of those things, and I think that long stint in, <clears throat> in prison helped him to to see the life in a different light. Because I think when he was born, I think he was kind of like middle class mm -hmm. and a middle class um, black person in that country. And he's some things he missed in his artwork and they, they required more from him. And he finally gave it up at the end. That's beautiful. That's beautiful observation. I liked everything about what I saw this morning. I liked the way the artist talked about his, um, his uh, sequence of, of how he paints, how he gets a nucleus. And then he explained that, in his opinion, the art was about yourself and others and, uh, and your ego. And uh, I love the way that, I think it was a younger art, had made a museum that traveled and he exposed the art to people in such a unique, creative way. I just, I was crazy about that. Um, I like the, the fact that he called it the Museum of Daily Life. And isn't that what art does? It reflects our daily life. Well, in, in his particular case, uh, he comes from Benin, which is a, a fairly small African country. And there are no, there are no art galleries there. It's very tiny. It's a very tiny country. I'm looking at it on the map. Yeah. It's very small. Yeah. Extremely small. You know, there are no art schools, there are no uh, galleries, there are no museums for art there. And so when he went back to his own country, the only way, you know, the only option he had, you know, to introduce his art to people was to take it out into the world. Okay. And I, I thought that was a really you know, imaginative solution, you know, rather than trying to do it the traditional way of, you know, building a building and stuffing all your art inside, you know, he took his art and he took it out into the world so that, you know, the people, you know, in that, in that, you know, in that city, in that country, you know, could actually see it and experience it. Um, and I, you know, I think, I think that was a, 
you know, it was a great solution, you know, for what he needed to do. So, um, anybody else got anything, comments? Come on. Well, one thing I would like to see is, is it, if we could go out on the streets and, and project like I, all of our different arts of this little group here, everything mm -hmm. is different. And people go in the museums and strike opinions. They can go out in the open and strike opinions, but they will never know what your opinions are because you can't get your stuff in a museum for people to see. The only <laughs> way you can do it is out in the public. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's think about that now, okay? You know, because that brings up some interesting conversations. Uh, because one of the struggles that really both of these artists have is a very common problem for all artists, which is, as my ex would call it, exposure, okay? And, uh, you know, she had a, uh, you know, a rather quirky take on this idea of exposure. And she, you know, coming from New York, she would tell you, you can die from exposure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, or you can die, or you can die while trying to get exposed. You know, and uh, or you can just plain die. I mean, hello. <laughs> well, and and for the older gentleman, uh, Mr. Abraham, um, he, uh, you know, I mean, he's eighty-two. I mean, he hasn't shown anything in probably 30 years. Um, and why? You know, because it, you know, it's, it's not that somebody hasn't been trying and that he hasn't been working with people to try to get his work into the world. The problem is that <laughs> in a lot of cases, you know, the world is kind of disinterested. Um, and particularly, you know, I think when you come from you know, a continent like Africa, and you have museum curators and people like that, and they go, okay, you know, all right, so you want to do a, an African art show, and, and they kind of think about, well, where's our audience, you know, are people going to be interested in this, or are people going to want to come and see this, and, um, you know, I, I think it's it's kind of a hard sell sometimes. And, you know, different periods of time, I think it was a very hard sell. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a difficult, you know, it was a difficult path. Um, but, <clears throat> and, you know, this is, this is the problem that all artists have. You know, you know getting, getting your work out into the world. You know, how do you get people to see it? How do you get people to, to interact with it, you know, to give you feedback, um, you know, and, and that's always the struggle, you know, for all artists, uh, you know, the biggest, the biggest part of your art career is not in making your art, it's in getting your art out in the world, you know, it really is, that's, that's the biggest part of the work is sharing it with other people. That's my own personal experience as well. So, at any rate. Um, what else do you have suggestions for how people might do that? I, I love what the lady in our group said about, maybe we should have an art parade. Maybe we should, you know. <laughs> um, we can also uh, share a lot of our work in different festivals. They have a lot of them, especially coming up in the spring and summer, that we can, uh, you know, get a booth at. And uh, there's sometimes a large number of people who visit those sites and they can uh, see our art. Or perhaps the, uh, the senior, the uh, senior uh, uh, department in Fulton County also used to have an annual art show, I think. I don't know whether they still do that. In fact, that's where I met you, Charles. Right. Um, yes. And we do. Every year, uh, we showcase the art that a lot of you make. Um, usually, it's at the centers. Uh, we've tried to make that less local, where 
each center is just doing their own thing. And we're trying to open that up and then, you know, have actual transportation for people to come from one center to another so that they can see what's going on at each of those locations. Um, you know, but we've also tried to put together and Eloise, I, I think, you know, I think one of the places that I met you first was down at Prior Street. You had some work at an exhibition down there where we had kind of a joint exhibition, you know, of all the centers and, you know, people ended up putting their work, you know, in, um, you know, in that show. Uh, so. I went to one of those expositions and I went to all every center and it was, was just wonderful. I enjoyed it because I saw a lot of different medias, uh, art that people did that wasn't, done, wasn't being done at the center that I was in. And I really, particularly the, the, the quilt, uh, and that, that was a fantastic exposition of quilts, those who were making the quilts. But I, 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 my thing is to the people that would like to do one on, on the streets or in festivals and stuff like that, what would be your objective? Are you, are you want to be known because you want to just be known or do you want to uh, market your work to, to sell? So that would be my, uh, I would like to know what, why would you want to do that? If you just want to be known or do we want to uh, market? Are you ready or you want to sell some of your work? <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, I, you know. Yeah, well don't if think- you, If you're unable to show your work, you can't market it. Right. I mean, do you, is that, what, is that your end goal? You have somebody to come see it first. Yeah. Well, is that your end goal? Style or not? Well, my, my, my question is that your end goal? Is that what you want to do to make some soft cash? Right. Soft money? Well, my, my, well, I guess my comment would be they kind of go hand in hand, don't they? Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you've got to do both. And you always put your work out in the world. Um, I don't know about you, but I know I personally have way too much of my work you know, in my house and in my studio. And right. believe me, I would, I would love to let a lot of this find a forever home on somebody else's wall, somebody else's house, and let somebody else live with it and enjoy it. You know, right. that's, right. that's kind of the purpose of, it's not the sole purpose, but it is one of the purposes that we're artists is that we want to share, you right. know, who we are and how we see the world and how we right. perceive the world around us. And we can't do that if all of our work is sitting in our house. Can't you know, what was, what, what was interesting is that back in the day when I got one of my first homes mm -hmm. and uh, I had, I just had money to buy furniture and stuff like that, but I loved art at that time. And the library would allow you to rent artwork, actual paintings that they had in their possession. They might not have been, they might have been copies of originals or something like that, but they allowed you to, um, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to take them out. And you could take them out for like three months at a time and then I, I would renew it. So my home always had new pictures in it all the time until I, until I can afford to buy more and more of my own. Then I didn't have to go and get them from the library. And I don't think libraries do that today, but it surely would be a great thing if you know you loan it to the library and they would loan it out. And then you would, uh, after a period of time, you get it back and give them something else and they will loan it out. And someone is enjoying that, you know, on their walls. But I don't see any of that happening here in Georgia. But it was a wonderful thing for me to surround myself with some great pieces of work that I did not own, <laughs> but beautified my home. So that's another program that could be considered for yeah, people that want to show. Yeah, well, actually, not long ago, um, probably within the last five years, you know, Fulton County did a, uh, a, a huge purchase of local artists. And, uh, you know, they, I think they purchased almost like 600 pieces of artwork, you know, from individual artists within, you know, Fulton County. And, uh, 
and then they've, they've taken that art and what they've done is, um, most of you may be aware that uh, they've built several new libraries and they've remodeled all of them pretty much so. And, um, you know, they've taken that artwork from the local artists that they bought the artwork from and they've actually put it in the libraries so that people have access and see it. Um, you know, which, you know, that, that served, uh, many, you know, many different purposes, you know, and it really helped the Atlanta art community, uh, because, you know, artists need to sell their work. You know, they need to stay alive. They need to be viable. If they can't, you know, if all they do is spend their money on producing work and they don't sell it, then pretty soon you find yourself in a position where you can't afford to make more work <laughs> because you can't afford art supply. So, you know, public art projects like that or, you know, and, per and big purchases like that are sometimes really, really important to a community. And hey, Charles. The question is, how do they whatever. select the artists to pick the, the artwork from? Nobody's ever come to your door. Well, not your door, but meaning, say, all of our doors okay. the, the, uh, to, to view our artwork to see if they would want to purchase any of it. They would go to somebody that they know, like you or, or no. some of the other artists in Atlanta that are way more better well known. Actually, that's not true. Uh, because they so, didn't ask me five years ago. <laughs> yeah, but well, and here's the thing, you know, Fulton County actually put it out and they, you know, they offered it to everybody within the Atlanta metro area. Um, you didn't have to be associated with the county and you submitted, you submitted your work online and then, you know, there was a, a selection committee who, who basically you know, picked the art that they were going to uh, to purchase. So, you know, there are, you know, there there are places, or you know, they do advertise in places, you know, for buying artwork. And that I've never seen. Yeah. Hey, well, Charles. Okay. Yes, John. Uh, whatever happened to the um, library project we were talking about some months ago, where? They were going to exhibit senior work. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, John, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I have good questions. <laughs> yes. I, I wish I could tell you. Um, you know, I mean, you know, we had a couple of meetings about it. You know, we were supposed to begin to move forward with that. And then, you know, I never heard anything back you know, from anybody about it. Um, and so, you know, I, I, you know, that is something, you know, to, to ask about. Uh, whether that will still happen, I'm not sure. Um, one of the things that we're talking about right now is this Older Americans Month coming up, which is, I think, in April. And, um, you know, doing another evening of the arts, because that's generally when we do that, uh, you know, that show. And so, you know, we're, we're going to be working on that right now and trying to organize it and, and get work, you know, into the centers. Um, you know, initially, I think the thought is we're going to try to do it in the centers, but there's some conversation that we may try to do something different where rather than having it at the four centers, we have it at an offsite uh, space. And, um, and, you know, people can put their work there from all four centers, you know, so it's a collective uh, exhibit rather than each center doing their own thing. So, so there's, there's conversations back and forth about things like that right now. And we're, we're trying to figure out as we go forward in the next year or so, you know, what that's going to look like. Um, you know, I was talking to Ilan at the beginning of the class, and he was saying that he was missing, you know, being able to go to the center on a regular basis. And, you know, now this, nothing is set in stone, you know, right now. And it's, it, it all can change, 
but uh, you know, there's, there's conversations about, you know, what is this going to look like by the end of the year? Uh, and rather than just doing, you know, a couple of students, you know, in a space, are we going to be able to go back, you know, to the levels that we were previously and really, you know, have kind of engagement again? Um, and when is that going to happen? You know, because it will, you know, it will happen eventually. You know, I mean, they're not going to keep those centers there you know, using them at like, you know, one quarter capacity like they are right now. Uh, you know, they're going to, you know, they want to utilize them to the fullest. So, so my guess is, you know, that as, as things move forward, you know, that they're going to go back uh, and, and try to get back to the level that they were. So I, I don't think you have long to wait, you know, to be honest with you. I think probably by the end of the year, you know, they're going to be looking at, uh, you know, trying to bring, you know, everybody back into the center again. So, you know, now. I think it can be sooner because I was surprised and I was there uh, last week to said that uh, masks uh, were optional. Right. Well, you know, and I mean, that's happening. That's a start, that's a start toward opening. More. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, all you know, all evidence, you know, is, you know, at this point in time, is that, uh, you know, for the vast majority, you know, we've got a large segment of this particular population, you know, being older people, you know, I think we're at uh, 85, about an 85 to 90% level of vaccination, you know, within the Atlanta metro area for people who are you know, over, I think, 55. Um, you know, the numbers are lower, you know, for people who are younger. Uh, but, you know, in this particular population, we're, we're highly vaccinated. Um, and we're not highly vaccinated with just one. You know, we're highly vaccinated with, you know, the, the two doses plus the booster, <laughs> you know. So, you know, I think there's a high level of confidence in, in the county that, uh, you know, we can begin to sort of resume, you know, more activities safely. And that's, that's the key, is they want to do this in a, a way that's, you know, safe for everybody. And so, but, uh, you know, that seems to be where we're headed right now. Um, but, you know, getting back and, you know, to the subject at hand, which is, you know, we're talking about, you know, African art in general um, and what that is. And I think if, if you didn't get anything else, you know, out of the, the last two weeks, um, you know, hopefully you got that African art is not one thing. It's a lot of different things. You know, it's, it's both, both the history and the traditional, but it's also, um, you know, contemporary art, you know, and it's the, the influence on, you know, even contemporary American and European art, you know, as, as well as just the stuff, you know, being done in Africa itself. Um, one of the things that have happened really within the last, say, 30 to 40 years, uh, there's a lot of people who have left Africa. You know, they've left Africa, they're living in places like Canada, the United States, France, Germany, uh, literally all over the world. You know, and uh, a lot of these people have taken their culture with them, including their art. And, uh, and now, you know, they're producing art that's sort of this blend, you know, of the culture that they moved into as well as their roots and where they came from. So, you know, it's, it's pretty diverse. Um, and in fact, I've got one more video that I'm gonna show you and it's very short. It's really only about five minutes. Um, and again, you know, this goes back to the question of, all right, you know, who are African artists, right? And so uh, let me share this with you real quick. 
and we'll talk about it a little bit, and then we'll kind of wrap things up for today. Mm -hmm. There we go. All right. So like I said, yeah, this is a whole three minutes. Wow. You know, what can we say? But, you know, take a look at this guy's work and uh, tell me what you think. All these tubes would have been placed nicely in a row from darkest to light and would have their lids on. This doesn't happen anymore. It's all about what actually happens on the canvas. It doesn't have to be so neat. I'm Ryan Hurt, South African born artist living in Cape Town. I chose these, these characters because I mean, it's a potent theme that's relevant, it's current, this is happening in our world today. I came across a more statement from the Pope on gay marriage. I don't mind to judge, it's actually going to be the title of the show. There had to be what the world sees as great leaders and you know some heavy dictators. It's like the good and bad of everything. That's the flip side to to everything. Um, and, you know, good comes bad, and bad comes good. As an artist, I'm not trying to make a huge statement. It's a it's a gut feel. They need to be in a room together right now. So it wouldn't it wouldn't be right not having a Hitler or a Bin Laden in this show. They, they have to be there. They're not the easiest portraits to paint, but. They need to be in, in, in the room with, say, a great Nelson or a Lincoln. As an artist, I hope you have to document it. It has got that feel, even in my technique, I think. The way I paint, it sort of has that evolved state where they're quite detailed and then it's sort of broken down um, to very like, sort of abstract mark making and almost degenerated like, sort of effects more chaos around me, more emotional, raw emotion is created through these sort of mistakes in a way that's identifying these mistakes and putting those out and keeping those sorts of details, like little gems, knowing that they're there before I could just take a pen and completely just abstract them. I've got to still have the idea that, you know, you just see it at the conceit kind of I don't want to make it too obvious here. It's sort of abstract expressionism. There's just a lot of palette knife and brushwork, rollers. There's just a whole bunch of tools I use to create an image. Um, anything really goes. The work happens on the canvas, it's chaos. It's, it's identifying those right marks. Yeah, I'm not even sure why I'm paint like that, but. Mm. Just see it. An urgent met. Okay. Anybody got any thoughts about the work he was doing? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I, I wish I could let myself go. Mm -hmm. to to that abstract level uh just but my psyche won't let me <laughs> yeah it's it's you know a lot of people when they begin to look at a lot of contemporary art you know the comment is oh gee you know uh, my kid could do that <laughs> yeah not <laughs> it's <laughs> Yeah, sometimes it's a, a lot more difficult than most people. But this this wasn't uh, that type of abstract to me. It was almost a representative uh, abstract that uh, you still could, uh, you know who the subjects were. Right. Uh, the, ones, right. the ones that are just, you know, paint spattered on a canvas. Yeah, that you know, I would say the same thing my kid could do it. But uh, these were actual recognizable uh, portraits. Well, they were, in a way, um, and see, that's that's kind of the interesting thing about some direction. Well, 
contemporary modern art is that when you're standing there like very close to it, it's pink, you know, and you see very clearly, you know, how it was constructed and the layering of the paint and things. And then when you step away from it, it becomes a very recognizable image. Um, May you know, I say something? You? Armando, you know, you want to say something? Uh-huh. Okay, say it. <laughs> to John and, and um, Robert. Yeah. Keep, keep, uh, don't change your style. Because I don't care about abstract because I don't understand. <laughs> to me, a pain has a message. But I see an abstract pain, and I don't know. But I think yeah, this artist actually, you know, was more representative uh, art that you could recognize. It's not just that, let's say, splattered paint on a canvas. Right. Uh, so I think Armando, this has got a little more, it's just abstract, but it's a, like Bob said, letting loose and uh, painting very loosely mm -hmm. instead of that real tight uh, the overwork that we <laughs> Yeah, we all like to do that. Well, right. <laughs> I agree, John. Well, my right. comment is, if you're going to buy a portrait for your house, mm -hmm. you would like to see, see everything as an opinion. You, I love the abstract piece if it had been more instead of a, a, a person of anything but uh, a, a portrait. I'd like to see a portrait like I think you look like or that you appear to look like. I, and it's representative, I could barely tell who it was because it was representational, but I would like to see the, the, anything else but a portrait that way. I, I would like it, if it wasn't supposed to be a person, just an abstract on the piece would be nice. But if you're ordering a portrait from someone, personally, I, I wouldn't enjoy a portrait, but I would enjoy other pieces of art that was built, constructed, like he constructed that in the type of painting he did of that. I thought that was beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, and... But just not the subject matter. I would have changed if I could have. Uh, you know, any, any subject matter other than a portrait. Yeah. Well, I think in his particular case, um, he was getting ready for a show. And this is one of the things that I wanted to point out. Uh, this was kind of a promo or an advertisement. And where was he showing? He was showing in London. Now he's a South African artist. But what does it say when it's a South African artist has to go to another country, you know, for a big ex exhibition of their work, you know, like London, for example. Um, and it, it begs, it begs one to question about, okay, if I were an African artist living on the continent of Africa, you know, mm -hmm. are there not venues that I could show my work? Are there not venues that I could get my work out mm -hmm. to the public, you know? And, and then if not, you know, how do we develop that, you know, uh, so that we don't have to go to places like London? you know, or New York or Chicago or LA, you know, to get our work noticed. I think there's very few places on the African continent where you could go. I, I, I don't know exactly, but uh, I would think, you know, that there's some very large major metropolitan cities, but other than those, I don't know where you would go on the continent to display. You couldn't, you couldn't just stay in anywhere you know, in some of those countries. He's going where the money is. That's exactly. right. He's exactly. going where the people are. Where, where the people are and the money and the money. Yeah. And you notice, you notice who he had pictures of, famous people from American history. Right. Abraham Lincoln. Well, he did have Muammar Gaddafi and, um, you know, several African leaders, um, you know, that he did portraits of as well, like Idi Amin and... Uh, you know, not necessarily nice, you know, 
nice, warm, and friendly people, but you know, certainly people that would be recognized, um, you know, pretty much so by an internet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he even had an American, Abraham Lincoln. Wow. <laughs> Um, anybody else got any thoughts about that? No, too, too early to go and eat lunch, so keep going. You're gonna I, go think, I, think he, I think he has to go to the marketplace, as uh, Naomi was saying. It's really about capitalism when you get down right. to it. Mm -hmm. and, and what will sell? And yeah. you have to, if, you, if you're trying to sell, you, have, you can't just go out there and do what you want to do and hope somebody will come just because you build this baseball field. It won't happen that way. Unfortunately, and, 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 and you know, because back in the day, we know was the, the Catholic church uh, or, the, or the church that was, the artists were uh, commissioned to do all the work. And if they didn't do that, they wouldn't have had any, any livelihood at all. Right. So it's about, at the bottom line, it's about capitalism or selling your work, whatever, you know, and convincing people of that. And many of the artists were, that we're talking about, many of them before, uh, all the great artists, they didn't get known for their artwork until after they died. Because during that period of time, nobody was interested in that at all. Nobody was interested in a war picture that this young this, the guy just got through doing, all of that in installation about this, the art and all those nine panels that he did. But he got all that from prison. Nobody was interested in that until after the prison. And even Picasso's, his uh, installation that he did, that was about World War II. Nobody cared anything about that until so the war was really in its, and uh, they were entrenched in war. And then people took a look at that and see what was war really like before the internet and TV and all those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And now we have the television, so nobody's doing that. It's but I do remember- It's smart marketing. It's smart marketing. Mm -hmm. You go where your market is, the biggest market. New York, London, Paris, that's yeah. the big market. The, the capitalism, the, but the who, who, the people that have the money, that's the, the money. And then, yeah. yeah the money. And yeah. what did Picasso do? P Picasso was a fabulous marketer. Where did he market? Just Paris or where else did he market? Well, New York. He was, a, he was a well known artist when he did that. But he <laughs> knew, but that yeah. man was no dummy. He knew how to market. Well, he's an unusual person. You know, he was a great artist. Yeah, but it's not, they're great artists and they don't market. You have well, everybody, market. every artist does not know how to market. He's Absolutely. not a marketeer. They are an artist. <laughs> That's true, Claudia. And, and, uh, and back in the day, how many people walked through the Sistine Chapel to see that? You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, Rebecca, you know, Rebecca asked a, a really good question, I think. Uh, and, you know, about Ryan Hewitt. And she said, you know, Ryan Unit Hewitt painted famous people so that he could sell his work, don't you think? Yes. Mm -hmm. and, yes. and right, you know, it's yes, he did historical yes. figures. So yes. yeah, I mean people would recognize it and it was done in a contemporary way. Um, so it was a new way of looking at, you know, these individuals uh, in a in a, a more you know, current way. Um, also, a lot of cultures uh, have priorities and art is not a priority. Maybe survival is a priority. Therefore, it's not as important. I, we're in a capitalistic society, so we promote things. to. That's how we get uh, our, build our economy. But uh, there was one culture that was highlighted, I guess, uh, Wednesday, in mm -hmm. which they didn't have a name for the word, I mean, for art. So it's not important in that culture so it just depends on which uh you know society you're talking about yeah. well yeah i think it's important to look at that and understand they don't see it as a separate thing that's special and unto itself it's part of their daily activity it's part of their culture you know um you know and it has a different function you know within their society than it does you know if you're living in Atlanta, Georgia, or New York, or somewhere like that, so, you know. Well, we we yeah. still see art in our schools and things as just something to keep kids busy. Keep kids busy at home, give them some paper and pencil, some crayons, it's just keep busy. They don't, they don't see it as a, a work of art. I was happy to see a lot of families that had their children 
at the at the art museum on last weekend, and yeah. the, the, so the children can really see what can you can do really do with art, and that art is special. But otherwise, it's just something that we did back in the day and still do today. And give the kids some pencil and paper and crayons and tell them to go play. So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's an activity, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, Bernice, I know you're here. I see you. Bernice. I don't see you. Uh, the KCHAJ. That's, that's uh, Bernice. Yeah, okay, yes, I see, okay. Yeah. Bernice. Maybe she walked away. Maybe, yeah, she, she might be. Getting... No, 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 I was trying to, I, I don't know what, I, what was happening today, but I was trying to unmute while you were talking. Oh, okay. Somehow it, it, it was not doing that. Oh, okay. All right, mm -hmm. anyway, so I'd be curious, what do you think of all this? Um, <laughs> two thoughts. I, 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 I initially thought that uh, this week's art was going to be, um, I think you said Asian art or something like that. And we, no, we were no, going no. to do Af African art on one week and different kind of art on another week. But I'm pleased that you, you, you went ahead and did it, another one. But, uh, but um, uh, the other thing, um, even, even though, and, and I, this, this is probably not um, a good thing, but e even though I like hearing the history and all that, I really would like to see more paintings than people talking, you know. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Unfortunately, I don't make the videos. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> it's about time for you to make your own video. Yeah. So we can watch it. Yeah. But, you know, um, you know, I think, I think what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to cover an area that doesn't get talked about a lot, right? And make right. all of you aware of the fact that there's a lot of stuff out there in the world, you know, from mm -hmm. all these different places and trying to tie that together in the end with the fact that because of the world that we live in today, and the fact that, you know, there is so much communication between different parts of the world. Um, you know, you can see a lot of it. You know, you, you can see a, a great deal of it, actually. Um, and it's much more accessible now than it was 20 years ago. So, mm -hmm. You know, because of this thing called the Internet. And the wonderful thing. <laughs> yeah, the wonderful it's thing. Accessible. Yeah. Well, the wonderful thing, you know, about, you know, all of this with you guys is that, you know, 20 years ago, you'd have to get on a plane and have to go travel to go see these things. Now, mm -hmm. if you're curious and you want to find them, you have this device that you're sitting here looking at right now that you can use to go explore the world, you know, and particularly about artwork and find different artists. Now, I'm not saying that it's easy and you got to do a lot of digging and you might go down a lot of dead ends, but, you know, it's amazing what you can stumble upon out there, you know, on the internet. It's, uh, it's a big place, right? So I would encourage all of you, you know, to spend a little time, you know, um, you know, rather, rather than playing solitaire on the computer, um, you know, spend a little time, you know, doing Google searches and, you know, find out about, you know, different media and techniques and different artists out there and what they're doing. Um, and then, you know, how you could use that, you know, as an influence in your very own work. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's kind of the point of all this for me. Charles? Yeah. Uh I have to tell you, thank you again for all the hard work you do in searching out yeah. the things for us to look at. Yeah. Uh, it's been fascinating. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's why they pay me the big bucks, right? <laughs> By the way, uh, Ms. Rebecca, did you finish your uh, children book? I did. I did. Thank you for asking, Armando. Yes. And right now, I'm cutting out 
the description that I'm putting on the back of each picture and pasting it to the back of each picture. And then I'm going to be looking for how to publish it. Oh, yes. That's wonderful. There you go. Wonderful. wonderful. Yeah. Um, okay. Anybody got anything else to talk about today? It's 11.27. Anything? Uh, it's, it's time for the cold weather to go. <laughs> Armando, I think you're right, and it's on its way out. It's just giving us, you know, look, it's not April 1st yet, okay? So we could still have the blizzard that we get like every, you know, four to six years, you know. So, you and know. Always in March. <laughs> yeah. I know I mean, Veronica love it because she's from New Jersey, but. But this is, yeah. you know, this is Atlanta, Georgia, right? And this is what Atlanta does. You know, it's, it's like, it, it will warm up, it will make you think it's springtime, and then somewhere around the end of March or April, you know, it will drop a mm -hmm. little snow on you, right? Things will freeze up for a few days. Just to kind of remind you, you know, that uh, yeah. you really can't count on anything around here. You know, it's gonna change. All right. Yeah. So, what, what day is Easter? What day is Easter? Uh, Easter. April the seventeenth. Yeah, uh, yeah you yes. usually ask the Easter. You can April, April the seventeenth. Uh, yeah. Charles. Yeah. That's yeah. A month away. Hang on. Say a month. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually after Easter, things change. Easter. Excuse me. For Easter. Armando. Huh? Excuse me. I, I like to say something. Yeah. Yes. First, I like to, to speak to Rebecca. Yes, ma'am. Rebecca. If you uh, are interested in a number that you can call about your book being published, yes, ma'am. Uh, I, I, if you will text me, I will or give me your give me your telephone number or something. I can text you the number to someone that helped me with my 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 family's book. Okay, and they're local. You might like that. I don't know. Wonderful. Thank okay. you. I certainly do. Thank yes. you for the offer. Yes, I really appreciate we do that. A, we do have a published author amongst yeah. us. Yes, yes. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We see. We're going to look at it. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Very good. Very kind. Georgia, so look, my family. I'll show it again. And I also have it in, in black leather. Oh, that's right. cool. All right. And I want, also wanted to say to uh, Eloise, I know that you love um, uh, painting portraits. So do I. And that the uh, the International Portrait Society is having their annual conference uh, in Atlanta uh, starting in April the twenty first. Yes, we are. So, is the local Atlanta chapter or the national chapter? The no. national chapter. Yeah, this is oh, okay, great. I'll look for that. National Thank conference. you. Thank so you need to check that out if you're interested in it. Yes, okay. I will. Thank you. Yeah. I've been there before, and she also has Charles, and they do have some very interesting. Um, uh, demonstrations that, that people do. I, I, one I've seen that fascinate me most was when a person just did all kind of marks all over the page, all over the painting, and then that turned into a portrait that, mm -hmm. that they were doing. So it was amazing. So. Yeah, I mean, if if you haven't been to the uh, you know portrait society, you know kind of conference, uh, it's well worth going. You know, they have uh, some great demonstrations, uh, some great workshops, uh, not only on technique and painting and getting to see different artists from literally, at this point, not just in, not just in America, but literally all around the world, um, come there. And, uh, but they also have a lot of information about marketing yourself as an artist, you know, how to, you know, how to be, you know, how to get your work out there, you know, how to get exposure, you know, how to make contacts with galleries and, you know, uh, art brokers and things like that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great place, you know, to go and actually meet a lot of these people and make connections. So it's, it's well worth, you know, it's, it's not free, 
you know, it actually costs a little bit of money to go there. And I, what is it? It's about five days, isn't it? Yeah, it's about, yeah, it's about five days. Yeah. Some book. One, two, three, four. It's about, it's about four days. Yeah. I have been, in, I have been intended to join that group, that organization, and I'm Thank you for the reminder because I had forgotten about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's a great organization and they can help you. You know, they can help you quite a bit. You make some great yeah. there. Um, yeah. You know, as far as marketing your work and stuff. So okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, check out their website. Mm -hmm. Will do. Just a reminder, everybody. Today is Albert's uh, birthday. Oh, Mr. Einstein. Mm -hmm. Okay. Einstein. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I put him behind me. Yes. Yeah. Hi, Dave. Well, you know, uh, tomorrow we have a share day, right? And uh, I've got a little bit of work from some people from last week, their drawings, things like that. Um, if you need, you know, if you have more stuff that you'd like to share and talk about, please send it in. But one of the things I'm gonna share, and, uh, and personally, I feel like this is art related, is uh, I'm gonna share some of the new images that came from the James Webb telescope. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the high resolution images of different- right. Wow. Um, you know, it's just, if you could wrap your head around, you know, how absolutely beautiful you know, the universe and all these different galaxies and things are, and not only just the beauty of it, how many there are, you know? And it's, it's, it's just stunning, you know, stuff. That so, would make a great abstract painting. Yes, it would. It's great inspiration for that, okay? And not only that, I, that's when you're always at the doctors who have some crazy appointment and I can't be with y'all. I, I just, I hate it. I'm but sorry. I can't be every day with everybody. Yeah. Because it's very really interesting and I love to see the progress everybody is making. All right, Ms. Chin, you get busy doing uh, uh, something uh, abstract about the uh, space. And, uh, yeah. I look at yeah, maybe maybe we'll do maybe we'll do a uh, you know a look a deep dive into fantasy and space art. That's a whole mm -hmm. other genre all into itself. So Anyway, uh, anybody else got anything they want to say before we go away? You know, I uh, hope you will send out some of those pictures on the email so I could see them. See, about the only way I'm ever going to see anything. Oh, okay. I, I, I would love to see some of those spatial spatial pictures. Okay, I can send them to you. It's not a problem. I would appreciate it. Really, I, I thank you. Yeah, yeah, not a problem. Yeah. All you have to do is ask. I'm asking. Are, are the classes still available on, on YouTube? Like they used to be. I can you can you can you can you also send those to me? I'm, I can't be here tomorrow either. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll tell you what you do. Okay. Um, okay. If you, if you want me to send you those images, just send me an email and just say I would like you to send me, you know, like the James Webb, uh, okay. and, and I'll do a reply and I'll just attach them to. It, okay. Mm -hmm. Hello. And that's for anybody, okay? Anybody who, who would like to see those. I'd be happy to share them, okay? Are there still videos of the classes on YouTube? Like YouTube? Yes, there are. I like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Actually, uh, that's one of the things I need to do today and tomorrow is I need to upload, sorry. I need to upload uh, the classes from last week. So, okay. But so you can uh, always catch up there, uh, Eugene. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can always go back and look at any of those classes that we've had that you've missed. You can find them on YouTube. They're all up there. How do I get to YouTube? Uh, what, what do I, after I get to YouTube, what do I put in to get them? Okay, so this is a little bit long, but uh, Fulton County Department of Senior Services art classes just do a search for that okay so you'll get current classes mine uh you know four or five other people's uh classes and you can go view any of them okay 
It's Fulton what County. You, what you, what you, what you say that again? It's Fulton County. Fulton County Department of Senior Services. Mm-hmm. They had it in, 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 in Google in uh, James Webb. I'm, I just now I'm looking all kind of picture about space. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, you can go Google them yourself, but I, I'm happy to send them to you. It's fine. Either way. Yeah. yeah that's including easy including picture of that telescope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot of pictures. Oh, yeah. Quite a few. <laughs> so, all right. Um, anybody got anything else they want to ask about, talk about? Anything we need to cover before we go away? No? All right. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. And um, hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow. And uh, if, like I said, if you, if you ever need anything, you know, from me, just send me an email, you know, ask me, you know, and I'll be happy to send you any of the images from the drawing class, any of the stuff that we shared, you know, it's fine. Okay. I'm happy okay. to try to help. Okay. All right. Anyway. Uh, enjoy this lovely, somewhat chilly spring day, but, you know, it's supposed to be a little bit warmer today than it was yesterday, okay? So. Okay, take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Bye. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Bye-bye.